Mauritius. On the 6th of August 2020, an ecological disaster happened in Pointe d'Esny, located on the southeast coast of the island. Ever since the MV Wakashio ran aground the coral reefs on July 25, many have tried to raise the alarm and warn the authorities about the threats this vessel represented to our pristine lagoon. Addressing Parliament the day before the disaster on August 5, the Minister of the Environment, Kavira Manu, stated that the risk of oil spill was low in an attempt to justify government inaction. Ultimately, what we feared most happened. Despite the despair caused by this tragedy, the mass mobilization in the aftermath of the disaster sparked hope for the entire nation. This movie narrates the period following which the MV Wakashio ran aground and oil started leaking from the vessel. But most importantly, it portrays the unprecedented mass mobilization that occurred in Mauritius. Indeed, this movie wants to depict hope amidst an oil spill. The hope that sparked when thousands of people came together to produce artisanal booms and save the lagoons of Mauritius. The hope that accompanied the grassroots response to the spill was an expression of the discontent of the nation with the government's handling of the crisis in the face of a disaster that threatened the life and survival of people. The hope that is grounded in a collaborative and participative movement for the common interest of the nation. Hope shows that in the face of crisis and challenges facing the world today, we can overcome all obstacles if we come together around a common vision that places life above all else. The MV Wakasho departed from Yangyuingang, China on the 4th of July 2020. The ship stopped for refueling in Singapore before running aground on the coral reefs in Pointe d'Esny, Mauritius, on July 25. The ship was heading to Brazil. The MV Wakasho is amongst the largest bulk couriers in the world. It had a dead weight of 203,000 tons, an overall length of 300 meters, and was carrying approximately 4,000 tons of oil when it ran aground. The ship belonged to the Japanese company Okiyo Maritime Corp and was operated by Mitsui OSK Lines, another Japanese-based company. The ship was registered in Panama. The ship remained stuck on the reef for 12 days without the government and the authorities taking action they needed to. On the 6th of August, there was a breach in the vessel and oil started leaking in one of the most beautiful lagoons of Mauritius. The vessel leaked 1,000 tons of oil into the lagoon. On the 25th of July, Wakashio crashed into the reefs of Blue Bay, Point Destiny. Stranded on the reefs for 12 days, the state and its institutions, as well as the business elites, all failed. We think that right in the beginning, when the MV Wakashio first hit the reefs, the authorities should have stabilized the ship with the help of existing tugboats so that the vessel remained perpendicular to coral reefs. Today, we are in a situation where the body of the vessel is under a lot of pressure and is destroying the coral reefs. Waves are causing the 300-meter-long and 50-meter-wide cargo ship to move on the reef in the east region, thereby destroying the corals. This can be witnessed by the fact that the sea has turned milky white around the ship. We think that there is an urgency to, to deploy sea booms in front of the vessel to prevent any risks of oil spill. It all began on July 25th, when we heard during the night that a ship had been stranded on the reef. I got a phone call from a friend in panic telling me to come quickly. The first thing I thought of was saving human lives. 
Were there people in danger on the ship? Could we do something to help them? When we arrived, there were already some of the skippers and fishermen working in Blue Bay. Following this, some activists and people who worked at sea tried alerting the authorities about the threats this represents to our lagoon. Unfortunately, the government turned a deaf ear. And on August 6, the MV Waka show started breaking up, leaking oil leading to an ecocide. The 12 days of inertia by the state regarding the Wakasho shipwreck, either because of amateurism or vested interests, has caused the government to be guilty of criminal negligence. In the evening of August 6, there had been a breach in the vessel and oil started leaking. Prior to this, pictures of the cracked ship were circulated. The government called it fake news. Can you imagine? People could have been sued and sent to jail for publishing real pictures, the government had issued a communique to say that it was fake news and that there was no problem. When the ship had already cracked and oil started to spill. I still remember what happened. I was in my board the day the oil began to leak. I heard people chatting. When I approached them and heard the news, I was really shocked. I knelt down on the floor and a man checked on me. I could not hold my tears. I had only heard about the oil spill, but when I saw that this oil had reached the Maibo waterfront, which is right behind me, I was inconsolable. It was really hard for me. I was really angry, but at the same time, I felt extremely sad, as if a member of my family had been murdered. I live on the coast and I've had a strong connection to the sea since my childhood. The ocean is our source of leisure and food. It is the ocean that contributes to the beauty of the southeast coast. It was terrible. I am really proud to be an activist of the political party Résistance et Alternative. Activists like David Sauvage and also our friend Kugan started to discuss about what we can do. Because this is our ocean. We should act fast to save our lagoon because our government and institutions had failed. As an activist of Résistance et Alternative, I felt involved when my friends said that we should think collectively and do something about the oil spill. David Sauvage came up with the idea of building artisanal booms made up of dried sugarcane leaves. We had to do something. We couldn't sit still and watch the oil link into the lagoon. We called for a meeting roughly around 9.30 or 10 p.m. Members of the National Committee of Résistance et Alternative met online. We started to discuss about the efficiency of the artisanal booms. If we should use nylon netting instead of cloth, we asked questions because we are not experts. A word which was very fashionable at the time. Also, why we should use sugarcane leaves. We also asked why we should use nylon threads and needles. We discussed collectively about this and the chances that it could work. At least we knew we tried. And it was already 11 p.m. when we finished discussing collectively. We started to wonder where we could obtain all the required materials. We started to call owners of local hardware stores and ask for key materials. We set up two different teams. The first team was responsible to fetch all the necessary materials and find a suitable spot where we could deploy the artisanal booms and see if they worked, while the other team was responsible to collect sugarcane leaves. Some members of this team wore straw hats and rubber boots as they prepared for the task at hand. On August 6, at night, we seek help looking for key materials. We set up our first artisanal boom. We made two on that day. With the help of a few residents of Maibor, we deployed the oil booms at sea. As it was a success, we spread the news on social media for people to gather and build more booms. 
In fact, we are trying to devise a system um, to contain um, surface oil until another team can come and um, collect the oil. The cylindrical handmade oil booms are made from nylon net. Another team is collecting dried sugarcane leaves to stuff inside oil protection booms as these leaves are claimed to have absorbing properties. As you can see, after we have cut the nylon net earlier, we are now stitching the net together so that we can fill it with dried sugarcane leaves afterwards. This is what we are trying to do to prevent the spread of oil. An entire team of activists has rallied around for the night in the hope that we can find a solution because we need to save our lagoon and most importantly, the entire ecosystem. To everyone watching us, you're welcome to join us. Any help would be much appreciated. All helping hands are most welcome. In fact, as soon as we set things in motion, we have been communicating about it. It fits into the open source model, which we call open source software or hardware. Free software is, from a philosophical viewpoint, a political concept as they alter the relationship between user and product by giving users important freedom over the product. That's what we've been doing since day one. We shared all the details about what we were doing on social media and also what we were planning to do. For example, we communicated the amount of nylon net that was required to make one boom. We were actually giving these details as the idea behind was mass mobilization such that everybody knew what we were doing and could improve their artisanal boom. And thus, as a result, it was a process of sharing creative and innovative ideas. On Friday, 7th of August 2020, after the first oil boom prototype was designed, three persons, namely Cédric Allot, Che Goulami and Giovanni Bavaggi, were the first three people to go into the water opposite the Mouchoir Rouge Island. They deployed the booms after taking advice from Ludovic Lucette and Christophe Bullock. The deployment of the first handmade protection boom was streamed live on social media to encourage people to help save our lagoon. It was Ludovic Lucet who convinced me to come to my waterfront, where a team was making booms. We went to the waterfront together and met with David Sauvage and then the rest of the team. We gave them indication as to where to deploy the artisanal booms. We then left the waterfront. I was the first person to notice the oil leaking. I made a number of live videos on Facebook and that was how David, uh, David Sauvage contacted me and I indicated where to deploy the first oil boom. We took a lot of time to build the prototype boom, but at around 6 o'clock in the morning we managed to complete the first boom. It was a moment of solidarity. In my bow, everyone wanted to lend a helping hand. We were the first to help the group of activists. We did not know what they were doing when they knocked our door. It was around six o'clock and it was cold. They just came out of the water and they were looking for hot drinks. We were initially planning to give them some water. Then my wife offered them coffee and biscuits. We bought bread, we just wanted to help. This is where the solidarity began. This is where the news began to spread in Maibor. Now people are coming from all across the country to build booms. A lot of people join in to help. When we woke up in the morning, my father, who was having his coffee, told us he had seen something on the internet. He saw that activists from Résistance et Alternative were making artisanal booms, and they were looking for coffee in the morning. My father, my sister Virginie and I made coffee and decided to go and meet them. 
We met a small group of people who were already busy making handmade booms. And it was then that we decided to join them. It is a group of political activists who have public interest at heart, who set things in motion. In such a way, we can involve the local inhabitants. So this, this open factory, this zone of occupation, of mobilization, was located on the waterfront, a public space. The fact that we were in a public space, under open skies, no wall, nothing was hidden. We were in town close to the oil spilling zone. This has led to unprecedented dynamics that we don't usually see in the conventional system. In terms of solidarity, the fact that the residents were involved in the process of decision-making, as well as other contributions like bringing a cup of tea in the beginning, participating in the organization of all activities. I woke up early in the morning, as usual, like all our local fishermen. I went to the Maibo waterfront where I saw a group of people and I wanted to know what was happening. I inquired out of curiosity and, um, you know, I questioned them and they explained to me that they wanted to prevent the spread of oil in the lagoon. I saw them making artisanal booms and realized it was a good idea. It was then that I decided to team up with a small group of people. After activists from Résistance et Alternative and local inhabitants had deployed the first oil boom and realized it was a success, David Sauvage sent out word on social media for people to gather and build more booms to prevent further spread of oil spilling, to contribute as the state had failed to respond to the disaster. This is what happened from the 7th of August. The night from the 6th to the 7th of August is an important date in the history of Mauritius in year 2020. Good morning, everyone watching our live. We are currently at the Maipo waterfront opposite the Mouchoir Rouge island. As you can see, earlier today, we deployed our first prototype boom that we made last night. On our way, we met people who were pumping oil. They told us that um, 50 meters of oil booms were needed between um, the Mouchoir Rouge Island and the waterfront. As the sun is starting to rise, we can now see that the oil boom has been successful. We are now calling upon people to make the maximum number of possible oil booms that will be used to help protecting the lagoon. The authorities and concerned parties can even deploy these handmade booms around the vessel if they need to. They are welcome. We used nylon nets, the cheapest we could find. We bought a 25 meters of nylon net, which was two meters high. We cut it half. This means that we ended up with two pieces of nylon net of 25 meters long and a meter high. We stuffed dried sugarcane leaves into the net, which was subsequently rolled over and hand-stitched with nylon threads and needles. Empty and clean plastic bottles were also used. We are calling upon each and every one across Mauritius who are watching to join us at Maibo waterfront. We need um, dried sugarcane leaves, 
We need um, artificial booms. We need nylon threads for sewing. And if you have plastic bottles, please help. I followed the live at night. I learned that the test of the prototype boom had been successful and that they needed volunteers. I came over the next morning with some nylon net and needles. So I was there from the first day they called for volunteers. At six in the morning, a woman heading to work on bicycle passed by and stopped. She gave us a few minutes. She was interested to know what we were doing. She showed us a quicker way to design the artisanal booms. This allowed us to take only 10 minutes to do the same job that we took three hours to do initially. It was very encouraging to see the know-how of local residents and their willingness to save the lagoons. Before the woman left, another one came. This is how the group grew bigger. This is something I'll never forget. Résistance et Alternative called for help. People across Mauritius answered. And when they did, they put their heart and soul into it. People came from different corners. Those who couldn't be physically present contributed in one way or another. This is something that will mark me for life. As from the 7th of August 2020, an incredible human adventure began. Thousands of people from all over Mauritius answered the call for solidarity from Résistance et Alternative to participate in what is now known as the Booms Operation. I was present as soon as I knew a team was making a prototype boom. They called for other people to gather at the waterfront, and I'm involved since the first day of the operations. I reached the waterfront at 10 in the morning, and when I saw the number of people who were there, I stayed until 9 p.m. to help making artisanal booms. I learned about all of this, I own a diving centre, via an email addressed to the Mauritius Scuba Diving Association, which was sent out to all diving centres. I decided to come to the waterfront to help as soon as I saw the email. It was on a Friday at around 10 in the morning. People were running in all directions. I attempted to find a way to improve how things were organized. Someone had to convey messages in the most effective way. The only way I could think of doing this was to have someone to convey messages and guide people to do things the right way. At first I started using a megaphone. Thank you for your presence. We, Mauritians, must come together as one. Feel free to gather and help. My wife, Davina, was at the waterfront and told me to come over as there was a good vibe there. I didn't listen to her and uh, did not go there immediately. I joined them after work in the evening and uh, never left the waterfront. When I saw the team, the way things were being done and the people who were there, I was amazed. I felt deeply concerned when I learned about the disaster. We all came together and got the chance to know each other better. And uh, we all came together and worked out a solution to save our lagoon. I witnessed the solidarity that brought together thousands of people at the waterfront to lend a helping hand. Although many of the people did not know how to stitch, they came and learned. It was as if we were a big family. I went there because I cared about our lagoon. For me, the sea represents life, and therefore I felt like my life was at stake. It is our lagoon, and I just couldn't sit still and watch it being destroyed. I went to the waterfront because it is my lagoon, where I earn my living. This is where I work, where I grew up. It was my duty as a Mauritian to come and to help clean and save the lagoon of Maibor. The sea is a major part of our life. It is our source of income. We lived an incredible human adventure at the waterfront. Unfortunately, members of the government never came, but the population joined us and supported us. 
and it was an extraordinary human adventure. I think everyone that came there experienced that amazing feeling. Mauritian people do care about the environment, in their inner self. They just don't express it every day. This disaster showed that in the face of ecological disaster, the population showed great solidarity, and it was a powerful moment. The objective was not only to make a functional boom, but also the human relation. Two complete strangers would be working together to make booms. This really allowed them to get to know each other and exchange information, such as their names, their addresses, and everyday lives. This was knowledge sharing, such that someone who was skilled in stitching and present from the beginning could share acquired knowledge with newcomers and work together. The booms operation led to a number of friendships and I met a lot of people. I was really impressed by the solidarity brought, the teamwork, ability to discuss about common goals. I found it really hard touching that people came from across the country to build booms in my ball. They did everything, from stitching the booms to placing plastic bottles inside it to help it stay afloat. I was impressed. It was heartwarming. I felt proud that we Mauritians decided to act and hope this paves the way for future actions. We had briefing sessions in the morning and in the afternoon, where we decided of future actions together with people and local residents. This led to strong dynamics of horizontal collaboration and demonstrated the true values of Mauritianism that we witnessed. Facing disaster, how we Mauritians come together to work out a solution is something I haven't seen often. It was a great demonstration of solidarity. People helped in one way or another, making booms, sharing food and drinks. We all tried to cheer up each other the whole day as friends and a big family. When I saw all these people at the waterfront, I said to myself that we Mauritians can show solidarity and that we can rely on each other. I hope that in the future we can show the same solidarity, come together again to build a new Mauritius, where all Mauritians come together in a wave of solidarity. It's a perfect example of humanity. Days at the Maibo waterfront were marked by coordination meetings in the morning to discuss about the most important tasks for the day set by the coordinating team. At the start of the evening, everyone who had been helping were socializing around music and art, which played an important role. This created friendships and a spirit of comradeship among people that were giving their time to save the lagoon and the southeast coast. What I find amazing is when disaster strikes, we Mauritians, we show love and solidarity. This could be felt at the waterfront during the whole week. I feel proud to be a Mauritian in times like these, because this is not something you will see in many countries. There was a demonstration of Mauritianism and a wave of solidarity where people across Mauritius gave a helping hand to the locals to save our lagoon. I am very proud of my country.
However, I believe that we should not wait for disasters to happen to come together and make things happen. This gives me a glimmer of hope regarding the people of Mauritius. I am at my bull since this morning. We are still making booms because we don't know what will happen next. Oil has been spreading in other regions, so people are still coming over to the waterfront to help us, and it is really encouraging to see this demonstration of solidarity since Friday. Citizens, students, colleagues or family members responded. Thousands of people came together to help. Many businesses also shared their resources to help prevent the spread of the oil spill. This mass mobilization lasted for at least two weeks. Most owners of big enterprises took many years to set up their businesses. We only took a single day to plan and organize a work which was seemingly very difficult. This was how it all started. This is how it should be done. It must be tighter and work well. Where should I tie this one? Um, wait, um, wait till the others are done. We will then use it around the boom. Once we spread the open source model of boom making, it led other groups of people to set themselves in motion. For example, youngsters invented a low-cost schema. I brought an aluminum tube from home, but you may use whatever material you have, as long as it is made of metal, an old TV antenna, for example, it can easily do the trick. It is extremely dangerous for people who handle it afterwards. It is extremely dangerous for... Another interesting example is the hair boom. After the initial phase of making artisanal sugarcane leaves booms, we run a workshop on hair booms using hair that were donated. This um, workshop lasted for about one hour and we were able to design the equipment and test the hair booms. We got feedback that there were blades in the batches of cut hair that were sent over by hairdressing salons. It was extremely dangerous. This showed that we can detect problems rapidly. We communicated about this problem publicly so that people working on this could get the information. It is fair to say that social media played an important role in the mobilization process. This has been a catalyst for the Mauritian people to join the mass mobilization at the Maibo waterfront in real time. This also allowed people to know how they could help. It was an open-air factory where people could lend a helping hand. We urgently need key materials to make artificial booms. We need nylon nets measuring one meter or two meters long. I am requesting for those coming to the waterfront now to buy needles and bring them along. We will use them for sewing. Here is an example of the needle we need. We also need nylon strings. We need boots. We need medical protective suits that were used during COVID pandemic. We need uh, people here at the waterfront as two kilometers of oil booms are needed at sea. Those who want to help just have to come to Maibo waterfront and be very courageous. Yes, all right. Please, to those who are donating plastic bottles, do make sure they are not crushed as nylon needs to pass through. They should have their caps on. Some bottles came without caps. People have been flying their drones across the coast to help us identify areas where oil is spreading. It is thanks to these people that we are able to identify missed areas that have been affected and do the needful. We are making an urgent request for white protective gear like our fellow friend is wearing. We really need them as we have run out of stock.
We need to make 100 artisanal booms. This means that we need to make 200 booms in total, as 100 booms are required as pay at all times. People who want to help are most welcome. We are waiting for you. It was a perfect example of horizontality in decision-making and in organizing production. For example, we chose environmentally friendly products over hazardous ones, like single-use plastic. If employees could make decisions about production at their workplace, they could have suggested the use of glass bottles instead of plastic ones. So what we experienced at the waterfront was the ability of people to decide over production regarding the organization and production and this made a huge impact on public interest. The production was not aimed at profit-making. In fact, the aim was not to generate profit for some people. It was really focused on public interest. This uh, occupied zone became subsequently a zone of civil disobedience as the authorities tried to restrict the access to the waterfront by designating it a restricted zone. We were working in such a way that the production and organization, the capacity to deploy the booms, were initiated by the people who were present here with us. Thousands of people had gathered. It was more significant than a public protest. That was when the people came to make booms. The government tried to restrict the access to Maibourg, deploying riot police. Notices were affixed all around the waterfront. No one was allowed to come and make booms. The entire population defied this attempt of coercion and intimidation. The artisanal booms operation was disruptive and it um, led to a bug in the process. A team stayed overnight to ensure the safety of all equipment. 20 minutes after we woke up this morning, 20 officers of the special support unit together with two police vehicles came to Maibo waterfront. We inquired upon the officers. They informed us as from this morning, volunteering was forbidden. Access will be restricted to cars, even to pedestrians at Maibo waterfront. The entire population defied the attempt to restrict the area. People refused to abide to the restriction. We will protect our lagoon at any cost. The population felt betrayed. It was like their sea had been betrayed. The ocean is the most precious gift we can give to the next generation. The ocean is the most precious thing that we have. Pravin Jagnat and his government have betrayed it. It was obvious that the government of Mauritius was overwhelmed by the running aground of Wakashio and the way the population took control over the oil spill. This caused a lot of tension in Mauritius, especially amongst the members of the MSM government. Although the government denied responsibility for the oil spill, the population still held them responsible for the ecological disaster. This led to a massive response to Bruno Loret's call to action, who at the time pointed out inconsistencies surrounding the running aground of the MV Waka show. I will do everything I can so that the truth prevails. I have evidence, like GPS localization. I will comfort the government. I invite Pravin Jagnet too. Bruno Loret even brought a private criminal prosecution against two ministers, Kavir Amano, Minister of Environment, and Soudir Modou, Minister of Fisheries. On 22nd of August 2020, Résistance et Alternative and other allied organizations decided to participate in the march led by Bruno Lorette.
We call upon the population to join the protest movement. It is extremely important, since we know that the government failed to respond to the oil spill. The population responded and took the right measures. We witnessed solidarity at Maibo waterfront. We witnessed moments of Mauritianism. We should keep the flame alive. A meeting was held on the 22nd of August and Bruno Loret, who had made the call for the march, was present. We developed an unprecedented collaboration whereby decisions were taken collectively by some 300 people that were present at the Unity House in Bobassa. There was an agreement to participate in the march of the 29th of August. We had a number of meetings afterwards to discuss about the details of the march, such as what kind of protest signs to use, the slogans, whether to bring along artisanal booms, should all organizations be present, everything. On the 29th of August, an unprecedented human tide poured into the streets of Polri to express their anger. We can achieve ambitious goals when we come together. The movement sparked a glimmer of hope to the youth and um, to the entire population of Mauritius. This led to strong demonstrations of Mauritianism. The march of August 29th shows that the Wakashio disaster came as a wake-up call for the younger generation to act. Two days after the protest that attracted more than 100,000 people in the capital, during the night of the 31st of August, the tugboat Sagaitan Duval, which was heading from Point Desny to Port Lui, sunk in the region of Poudre d'Or. Three crew members, namely Sylvain Addisson, Sujit Kumar Siou, and Laval Lindsay Plassan, lost their lives. Their bodies have been found, but Captain Moswadek Binik's body disappeared into the sea. He was never found. This tragedy added to the anger of the population as there was still confusion about the sinking of the tugboat and the reason they were at sea in the middle of the night. We are in a situation where the population is acting. The movement is acting in a crucial moment we have to make a transition and politicize our request. We must make it real. This is why, after the 29th, when there was not any political claim for the future of the youth, right of nature and housing right, all important matters of this country, all those political claims will be addressed on the 12th. Politics is, is essential how we live together, how we respond, for example, to climate change and social inequality. It will be a critical moment in this people's movement which started since COVID-19 and all the struggles prior to it. We invite all citizens of the Republic of Mauritius to come to Maibo on September 12th, Conversation Solidaire, along with residents of Maibo and the Southeast region, are inviting you to the huge protest that will take place, to everyone who love liberty, life and solidarity. Come so that together we build a new Mauritius, a new colorful republic. Come with your favorite colors. Come with the colors that you think will best suit this protest. I invite everyone to the march that will be held in Maibo at 1 p.m. It is time to take action. The movement began a long time ago, step by step. 
The 11th of July was a beautiful demonstration, even more beautiful on the 29th. I feel proud that Mauritians are starting to realize that they need to act to set things right, and it is not that difficult. In the same breath that we organized a protest on July 11th, on August 29th also, we invite the whole population to the march to express their anger following this disaster regarding Wakashio. I invite you to come over on September 12th. Here, let us gather together as one family. Come and join us at my ball. I invite people to come together to express solidarity towards all residents of the southeast coast. The aim of this march is to show solidarity among Mauritians. How in the face of disaster we can be solidary, irrespective of the color of our skin or religion, and how we can come together to work out solutions during a crisis. As a Mauritian citizen, I invite all Mauritians to come together on the 12th to bring change to the system with which I do not agree. Let us meet on the 12th in my bore. Let us come in full force at the place where it all began. I invite you to come to my bore because we all love our lagoon. Please come and join us to march together from 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. So just come as you are. Come support our cause and come protect our lagoon together with us. Don't forget this event. We will make history. Let's walk together in the streets of Maibo and make our voice heard. Let us march for the rights of nature, for greater transparency, for our country and for our children. Don't miss history. Join us on Saturday 12. When Maibo was brought to its knees, we Mauritians stood up. When my ball was in distress, we Mauritians stood up. When our children were sick because of the oil, we Mauritians sent them food and doctors. Today, I am proud that we are united as one. We saw the example of the new Mauritius. We have been talking about it in my ball, which is symbolic, because it showed the true definition of Mauritianism when thousands of people, youngsters, children, adults, teenagers, helped to build artisanal booms. This is Mauritius. This is Mauritianism. This is what political leaders need to understand. Mauritianism is rooted in our heart. No one can take it away from us. It is important that we continue to value Mauritianism as it will help us to grow as a nation. What do we do to a system that doesn't respect democracy? What do we do to a system that is leading to the destruction of nature? 
What do we do to a system that does not respect women or children? What do we do to a system that exploits workers? That's it. What do we do to a system that doesn't respect young people? What we have witnessed at the waterfront is a glimpse of a new Mauritius. We gave hope to the young generation. The youth stood up. My bull is the capital of hope. My bull showed to the world how we can come together as one, how we can address the ecological disaster. Thank you very much. What will we do to the system? Good morning, Mauritius. Thank you. Thank you for being with us since the 6th of August to save our lagoon. Thank you, David, for starting the booms operation. The government is fooling us, tour boat operators. The government has been promising an allocation since the 28th. If it was not for the solidarity of Mauritians, we would have nothing to eat at home. We could have ended this movie with a protest that took place on 12 September 2020 in Maibourg. Like in Port Louis, not less than 100,000 people came together to demand a new Mauritius. But the events that followed one year after the oil spill showed clearly that the government failed to take stock of the unprecedented movement in Mauritius. One year after the disaster, on 7 August 2021, various activists, including members of Résistance et Alternative, who were helping at the waterfront, placed a commemorative plaque at the Maibo waterfront with the authorization of the local council. However, on Monday 17th of January 2022, Anwar Hasnou, Minister of Local Government, gave instructions to remove the plaque. It was an attempt to erase from our collective memory the negligence and responsibility of the state and that of the various ministers for the oil spill. A way to erase from our collective memory the incapacity of the government to respond to the ecocide that unfolded with the oil spill, which also led to the death of dolphins in the east. A way to erase from our collective memory the death of four sailors as a result of the catastrophic response of the government. A way to erase from our collective memory the public outcry that led people to take to the streets on 29th of August and 12th September 2020. A way to erase from our collective memory the birth of a new consciousness in Mauritius which is asking for greater participation in political decisions, greater transparency in public governance, greater accountability of the government and its representatives, greater solidarity and unity among the population and greater respect towards nature and life. In spite of all the attempts of the elites to erase our collective memory, there is an undeniable truth that the artisanal booms operation showed that when people come together to decide over their destiny, nothing can stop them. This historical journey has begun and is paving the way for a new Mauritius. Basically, we wanted to cover all the various aspects of people's solidarity in this movie. We are aware that unfortunately, this is not possible. This movie wishes to pay tribute to the thousands of people who came from all across Mauritius and abroad, who came together to save the seas and lagoons of Mauritius.